This cemetery was opened in 1822. And here you will find the, um, some of the oldest uh, graves in the city. Well, especially you will see um, uh, the graves of the early settlers and founders of the city. As you know, Nashville was settled in 1780. Most of the uh, African-American graves are um, to the back of the cemetery or the south side of the cemetery. Um, even in death, uh, before the age of legal Jim Crow, African-Americans were segregated and, of course, uh, 79 percent of them in this city were slaves and the rest were free Negroes. But even free Negroes are buried on the other side. They are buried on the south side of the cemetery. This cemetery um, is a great example of a historical classroom uh, because many of these tombstones are the only records that are left of uh, some persons who inhabited this city in the earliest decades. Uh, this cemetery, like many cemeteries, has a register. Uh, so you are registered in birth, at birth, and also we are registered at death. Uh, in this section here, you can find some tombstones for free Negroes. And uh, some of those families, you know, go back, you know, to the original settlement, 1780. A lot of these tombstones are going to be east and west because of religious uh, beliefs. And some of them are going to be with the, you know, the stone facing the east where, you know, the resurrection comes from. And so the bodies will just rise up and face, uh, you know, the Christ coming from the east. So a lot of these stones, notice they're gonna be east and west because of those religious beliefs. And you can see that Nashville was a very uh, religious community. This famous black buried out here would be uh, Frank Paris. A free Negro would be buried probably in this section uh, because Frank Paris was a Negro barber. Uh, I think he died in 1867. Uh, he was fairly well to do because all barbers in town were Negroes, mostly free Negroes dominated the barbering business and the hack service business, which we call taxes today. But this is um, Jerry Porterfield, and as you can see, his stone says he was 78 years of age uh, when he died. But he saved his master's life in downtown Nashville by pushing him out of the way of a runaway freight wagon. And the man was so grateful, he gave him a headstone. Now this section of the cemetery, for those looking for family history and genealogy, is more recent. And here you will find um, tombstones for African Americans, such as uh, one of the original Jubilee Singers, Fish University Jubilee Singers. William Carroll Napier. I was born a slave in Dixon County in the year 1824. My master did a remarkable thing that year when he uh, signed his will in 1848 in that he freed 28 slaves. This was such a remarkable high number that it was even mentioned in a Boston newspaper. But you know, we were the lucky ones because Master uh, Napier did not free all his slaves. Another 30 slaves he divided between his nieces and his nephews 
and his friends. And as I said before, we were the lucky ones because the favorite ones were the ones that were freed. That included my mother and her five children. That included his old cook, Charity. That included his old house servant, Samuel, Simon. And that included houseboy by the name of Sam, who was nine years old at the time. Mr. Napier did just a little bit more, though, for my mother and my five siblings in that he gave us total possession and use of his land on Richland Creek in Davidson County. There we were allowed to stay there for a whole year. We also received the crop and all the livestock. We were able to earn enough money for ourselves in that year to get on with our new lives. However, after that year was over, my mother came, became apprehensive and wanted to leave Nashville because she was afraid and didn't want to become a slave again. So she took four of my siblings to Ohio and they lived in Ohio. I was 24 years old at the time and I decided I wanted to stay in Nashville since I was born and raised on a farm and knew all about farm life. I stayed here and became an overseer. I got married to my wife, Nettie, before I was freed. My wife Nettie and her mother Rebecca were slaves of Mr. William E. Watkins. Mr. Watkins owned 42 slaves in Davidson County. And our marriage wasn't recognized because we were still slaves. But it was officially recognized and we have the papers uh, in 1891 in Nashville, Davidson County. During the year of 1860, during the census, in Nashville when it was taken, there were 17,000 white people, 17,000. And there were 3,000 slaves. Also, there were 700 free men of color. My wife and I were listed as free of color and we were also um, uh, called mulattoes. Mulattoes are uh, children of uh, white fathers and black mothers. One of the proudest days of my life was the day that I was able to drive my carriage as a hackman and carry Mayor Cheatham to the riverfront. There he got in a boat and went across the river to Edgefield and surrendered the city of Nashville to General Buell and the Federal Army. Another proud day of my life was the day that Mr. John Mercer Langston from Washington, D.C. came to Nashville to speak on the emancipation. Dr. Langston was a dean at Howard University, and he also spoke to the U.S. colored troops on that day at the state capitol. I was there, and my son James was there as well. Mr. Langston was so impressed with my son James because he was such a smart boy that he wanted him to come to Washington, D.C. to study. And not only did he become a lawyer, he also married Mr. Langston's daughter. The year now is 1880, and I'm living in Nashville, Tennessee, on North Cherry Street, which is not too far from the state capitol. And my wife's mother, uh, Nettie, is there. She's living with us. And uh, my uh, son, James, and his wife, Jane have moved back to Nashville, Tennessee. And oh, incidentally, he has become a city councilman. He was elected to the city council. I'm happy and my wife's happy too. Welcome, my name is William Carroll. I was born in 1788 up near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I died here in Nashville in 1844. That's a year before my good friend Andrew Jackson died here also. And a year before they started the state capitol building in the downtown. I was a businessman, I was a military leader, and I was also a politician. Two out of three isn't bad. <laughs> as a business leader, one of the things that I saw as an opportunity was in 1816, I thought we needed to improve transportation here, so I bought the first steamboat that was navigating the Cumberland River, and I named it for my good friend, it was the General Jackson. 
in the War of 1812, there was a lot of uh, activity. The British were instigating Indian raids all over the western frontier. And down in Alabama, the Red Stick Creeks had gone to war and were massacring uh, new settlements in Alabama. Tennessee declared war on the Creeks, and I was one of the generals that led forces down into uh, Alabama to fight the, the Red Stick Creeks. And at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, I was severely wounded, but uh, recuperated. And uh, shortly thereafter, I was uh, commanding all of the Tennessee troops before the Battle of New Orleans, and Andrew Jackson, my good friend, was the overall commander of all American forces at the Battle of New Orleans. We did defeat them. We were the two commanders of that battle. And as a result, uh, I was very popular back home here in Tennessee. So in 1821, the people of Tennessee elected me as their governor. We were operating under our first constitution, the 1796 Constitution. And that constitution allowed you to be governor for two years. But if the people liked you, you could have six successive years in office if they re-elected you every two years. And they did. Following that, leaving office in 1835, my friend is still in the White House as president, and Andrew Jackson was talking about doing what to all of the Indians in the Southeast? Removing them. So I was named to the Treaty Commission of New Echota, and we signed a treaty and removed all of the Cherokee from the Southeast, except for the few that hit out in the Smokies. They're still up there today. They then appointed me to a Creek Commission, and I worked uh, in the same efforts on the Creeks. Uh, I did die in 1844, and I am buried here. The state of Tennessee bought this big plot of land and put up this monument. It's the biggest monument in city cemetery. And they are telling you in stone what I did in life. The columns up here are cannon tubes. They're war cannons, and there are flaming cannonballs down here on the corners, the base of the monument. On the front, there is a medieval war helmet and there is a Roman laurel wreath with the Roman war sword. Now, the laurel wreath is upside down, though, because fame and glory are fleeting and brief, and they all go away. But not entirely. I still have the biggest monument in City Cemetery. <laughs>
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm George Washington Campbell, Campbell and with me on uh, our tour of the cemetery today is my granddaughter, Miss Hattie Brown. Would you say good afternoon, Hattie? Good afternoon, Hattie. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to welcome you this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Poe Hatton Maxey. My good friends like George here call me P.W. I was a tinsmith by trade, but I served as mayor of Nashville from 1843 to 1845. Prior to serving as mayor, I served as alderman. I was elected to the county clerk for eight years prior to my election as mayor. Later in my life, during the Civil War, where I was a staunch unionist, I also served as the chief pension agent under President Andrew Johnson. I was born in Scotland, educated at Princeton University. I became a United States Senator, a United States District Court Judge. I was briefly the Secretary of the United States Treasury, and I was the first Tennessean to receive a major foreign appointment when I was designated to be the Ambassador of the United States to the nation of Russia, where my wife and I befriended the royal family there. So you see, that George and I were two very influential persons here in Nashville back in the early 1840s. And what we want to tell you a little bit about today is the role that we played in bringing the permanent home of the Tennessee State Capitol here to Nashville. You see, George and another former mayor, Bill Nickel, they together own this little hill right up here. Little hill. Now, PW, let me set the record straight. Campbell's Hill, then, as it does today, towers 200 feet above the Cumberland River. Though it's hard to tell because it's surrounded by high-rise buildings today, that makes it that made it at the time a prominent landmark that was visible from all across the city. And we felt, PW and I, that it ought to play an important role in the history of our city and perhaps in our state. So let me give you a little bit of background. Since 1827, the Tennessee State Legislature had been meeting in various cities around the state. They met in Knoxville, they met in Kingston, they met just down the road in Murfreesboro. And those three cities, as well as several others, were vying to be the permanent home of the Tennessee State Capitol. But the legislature put a deadline on themselves. In 1833, they said that within 10 years, a permanent home must be selected. And as you may recall, in 1843, Yours truly was serving as mayor of this great city. So George and I got together and crafted a plan. As the deadline approached and no city had been designated as the permanent home for the capital, we figured we might be able to influence the decision. We had a, had a vision that a great state capitol building would stand on Campbell's Hill where it could overlook the entire city and in fact the entire state. So William Nickel and I got together and we sold the property to the city of Nashville for $30,000 in 1843. So as mayor, I was able to arrange and convince, persuade the, the county court to approve that $30,000 purchase, and we purchased that hill from George and his colleague Bill Nickel. Now, Nashville had something that no other competing city had. And when I offered that property to the state legislature, it was enough to persuade them to vote that Nashville would become the future home of the permanent state capital. Welcome to the Nashville City Cemetery. My name is Wilkins Tannehill. I was born in 1787 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My mother and my mother's father were Revolutionary War officers and by example taught me to be a great supporter of this country and its founding principles of individual liberty in conjunction with the Union of the States. As a young man, I was employed in our extended family salt works, which eventually brought me to Nashville in 1810. I haven't become prosperous with the salt, I opened my own grocery store here in Nashville and then a second in Pulaski. Also, uh, early on I joined the Nashville Library Company in 1813, marked my formal entrance into the city's intellectual activities. I spent the remainder of my years focused on writing and publishing great and important thoughts. 1813 also saw my having been made trustee of Cumberland College and later the University of Nashville. And on April 25th, I was the first initiate of Masonic Cumberland Lodge No. 8, a lodge that Andrew Jackson later belonged to. 1817, I was elected Grand Master, a position which I held seven different years with the exception of 1822-23, when Jackson was Grand Master, and 1825-26, when I was Mayor of Nashville. I was also Grand High Priest in 1829, 
and served my final term as Grand Master in 1841-42. During this period, I published books on world history, literature, and the Masonic Manual, which was the book in use for half a century. There's a portrait of me by the noted artist Washington Cooper. And in that painting, I'm pictured as I am here today in my Masonic vest. Well, these are not worn in public and are typically buried with my brother Masons. I'm a supporter of temperance societies, a founding member of the Nashville Historical Society, an early and vocal advocate for the establishment of a teacher's college here. But most of all, I was publisher, editor, and essayist. I'm a great believer and supporter and promoter of science and a passion promoter of the educated man, someone with broad and wide-ranging tastes and interests. I consider one of my master accomplishments to be the portfolio, a monthly journal, the content of which divides equally between Masonic topics and literature with no politics. It is my endeavor to combine useful instruction with rational amusement and to inspire a taste and desire for that general knowledge which renders the mind free from prejudices engendered by ignorance. My last major undertaking was the Merchant's Library and Reading Room, which was a subscription library downtown in 1849. I knew that Nashville would soon be one of the most important towns in the Western Valley, and I also clearly foresaw the war between the states and the passing of the South's feudal order. I oppose war as the most ultimate waste of our ultimate resource. On June 2nd, 1858, I passed from this earth blind while living at the home of my son-in-law, W.T. Berry, one of Nashville's very, very successful printers and its most successful bookseller. My funeral was held at First Presbyterian Church downtown and my brother Mason's laid me to rest here beside my beloved wife.